Here are the five best nonfiction books to check out in 2023. I reviewed 27 books this year, which is extremely light for this channel. It's actually pitiful how low of an amount that is. But I'm not going to give you some sob story summarized explanation of what happened right now. I'm going to do that at the end of the video. So presumably you're looking for those recommendations. Let's get right to that. In this video, my apologies for the leading title. I'm actually going to give you guys 10 recommendations. It's going to be two key curated nonfiction lists. The five best books we checked out in 2022 and the five best books we checked out that were published in 2022 with no choice overlap, all of which I highly, highly recommend checking out in 2023. Just so you guys know, there are affiliate links in the description. And if you buy anything through those links, like maybe these books, then I get commission, which helps me build this channel and keep making these videos. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Sam and I want to make self growth normal because people shouldn't have to look this information up. It should just be mainstream knowledge. If you agree, then please make sure to smash Smash that like button. All right, so this first list is going to be the books we checked out this year that did not come out this year. Number five is Know My Name by Chanel Miller. This book is an account of the author's experience in the high profile Brock Turner sexual assault case of 2015. To many of its readers, it is actually one of the most important books of its time. Hopefully, more people will check it out to understand what kind of troubles women face today. The way that she described how it all made her feel and how that one night just completely changed her life, it will give you goosebumps and it will leave you speechless as well. It's illuminating, vulnerable, polarizing, empowering, chilling, and so much more. But it also leaves you with a lot to think about regarding sexual assault, its emotional and physical effects on its survivors, and how the justice system, or at least at that time, views and treats high profile cases of it versus how the public does. Number four, How to Not Die Alone by Logan Yuri. Honestly, this really is a solid guide to not dying alone. It's very, very digital age friendly. And, and counterintuitive compared to other dating books that you might find. It is very quick to acknowledge both sides of a coin. And something that's rare that I'm, I'm happy to see in a book like this is that it applies to both straight and LGBTQ plus relationships. It was also written by someone who studied psych at Harvard, was the director for relationship science at the dating app Hinge, and learned how to help millions of people date more effectively. Number three is We Are the Weather by Jonathan Safran Foer. This was a very distinctly posed way of questioning what kind of crisis we've increasingly faced over the years with climate change. It shows almost an internal struggle of am I doing, am I even doing the right thing? It shows how little we truly understand about the sacrifices we make and a glance of the relationship between good and bad in a national and sometimes global generational context that you just can't ignore. And you can tell throughout the book, this is kind of strange, but that the author is like strikingly at war with himself. There's some intimate mercurial and introspective moments of it. One chapter actually starts with a conversation the author has with another person about the flaws in the reality of his viewpoint and lacking the self-control to practice what he preaches, like how writing the book and promoting it has or hasn't been enough. Number two, Principles of Dealing with the Changing World Order by Ray Dalio. I was a little bit late to the party on this one since it came out in late 2021 and I just didn't get around to it. But this is the type of work that you would expect from a guy like Yuval Noah Harari or Nassim Taleb. It's almost a series of big, big concepts falling under an even bigger concept, the order of the world and how it's changing. So we're talking about massive, massive economic cause and effect relationships and how people adapt to them as they change. The author, co-chief of the world's largest just hedge fund Bridgewater Associates and hailed by many as the Steve Jobs of investing emphasized the swinging of conditions from one extreme to the other and how it's the norm not the exception. This guy is a really, really, really out of the box thinker when it comes to economics. No economic system or currency lasts forever, but it's pretty typical for us to freak out when they fail. So in this book, you'll find out why that is and how many of the largest empires in the history have risen and fallen over the years. Number one is Cultish by Amanda Montel. This book was a fantastic breakdown of the language of cults and how it works with an interestingly relevant take on the matter, an engaging ability to deliver it, and not a single dull moment. It's about fanaticism in the form of a language that the author calls cultish. I think she actually coined the term, um, like English or Spanish or Swedish. You learn 
learn about what leaders say to get you to follow them and stay loyal at all costs. It's language that you cannot understand from the outside without hearing what former insiders say about it and how it worked. And isn't that not a really, really strange thing to learn about? Once you hear it, you can't unhear it. You really can't. You learn about how 900 people willingly died under the delusional leadership of Jim Jones, the craze behind Scientology and how L. Ron Hubbard created the massive empire it is today, how multi-level marketing schemes are driven by our desire to belong to something greater than ourselves, and how they kind of play on that, and plenty more. A useful work for the ages, and a very up-to-date approach to understanding the way of cult-like language and the narcissistic leaders who develop it as time progresses, this book simply blew me away on many, many levels, and I can't recommend it enough. On to our five best books of 22 that came out in 22. Number five is Never Finished by David Goggins. This was a follow-up memoir written by a retired Navy SEAL, ultra marathon runner, ultra distance cyclist, triathlete, and public speaker. His previous book, Can't Hurt Me, was a very solid book, almost literally. Like, we're talking about the kind of book that you can't hurt. <laughs> Dad jokes. However, in my opinion, this one kind of blew it out of the water. Like, let's be real. Can't Hurt Me was uh, what I think he called an audiobook podcast talk show thing, where he and the ghostwriter of the book, um, in the audiobook, in between chapters, they have these brief conversations discussing retrospectively questions about what happened in the chapter, and it's really interesting to hear what Goggins has to say looking back. But in Never Finished, Goggins evolved from this, an evolution if you will, with something else in between chapters literally called an evolution. The evolution, it's like an applicable story of Goggins breaking through to another side of the turmoil that he underwent in his life. This is so cool, let alone the podcast interviews in between chapters, and I wish that more audiobooks do, would do it. Goggins has a hard-headed personality that oozes its way through the stories in the book, like when he ran 240 miles with a torn ACL. But you can truly tell that his goal is ultimately to be the hardest person on the planet whatever exactly that means. At the same time, he is quick to admit even someone like David Goggins, who many of us could probably easily call a robot because of his level of discipline and focus on results, no matter the mental and physical cost, is resting on his laurels. He will admit that. David Goggins really showed his true colors in this one. Number four, Bittersweet by Susan Cain. Susan Cain came out with a book called Quiet, about the power of introverts in a world that cannot stop talking, which overall I wasn't really crazy about. However, she did do a splendid job in, in researching, and with the way that she compiled and presented that research, I still saw a lot of promise in another book if she would just put one out. Fast forward 10 years later, and that is exactly what she does. And boy, did this thing blow me away. In the same blend of like storytelling, examples, and diligence, and personal experiences, it explains why we feel sorrow and longing, and how embracing bittersweetness is the true life path to connection with others, creativity with yourself, and transcendence towards something above where you are. There's a beautiful range of testaments to her points throughout the book from different uh, cultures, belief systems, arts, and more that she lays out. I hope no one overlooks Bittersweet because it explains way more than I think we give it credit for about why so many of us long for like sorrow and melancholy and other emotions that we experience but don't give much thought to, really. Number three, Atlas of the Heart by Brene Brown. Seasoned shame researcher Brene Brown truly brought her A game to Atlas of the Heart. A for Atlas. I really need to go to bed. Um, the main idea of Atlas of the Heart was to go over 87 different emotions we experience that define what it means to be human. Yes, 87 different emotions. Yes, there are 87 emotions. No, there are. I'm serious. If you check out the book, you will see. As far as the content, as you can probably expect, this book is easily her most cohesive yet as a result. Quoting well-known researchers, going over studies, and storytelling, something she's w known well for, these things are all very balanced. There's not way too much more of one than the other two, and that can't be easy to do at all. The reason this is important is because if you see way too much of one, a lot of people in negative reviews, it raises this sort of degree of skepticism where it's like, well, how much do they 
really even understand this? Don't they care way too much about their own personal stories? Some people find it a little bit, you know, arrogant that someone's focusing so much on themselves. It's just stuff like that. That's why this whole balance I always talk about is so important. She goes so much more deeper and concisely too, which is the most astounding thing about this book, into these things than just the definition. It's differences between emotions, misconceptions, occasional humor, instructions, and much more. Brene Brown is known to talk a lot, a lot, about like specific emotions like vulnerability and shame in her books, belonging, connection. Not this whole breadth of 87 of them. This is a very, very useful and not often explored topic that she embraced with both awareness and fervor. Number two, I am glad my mom died by Jeanette McCurry. Yes, I know the girl who played Sam on iCarly, she actually put out a book. And it may seem trivial that she's just doing her job as a comedian of some sort with the name I'm Glad My Mom Died, but it's much deeper and darker than it seems. There are multiple reasons that it made such a huge splash of controversy upon its publishing. This memoir displays chilling evidence of the damaging long-term effects a mother's influence can have on her daughter's emotions, self-esteem, and well-being on the road to superstardom as a child. The most novel and unusual thing about this is how McCurdy blended dark comedy into the book. This made it a very delightful listening experience despite or on top of the sometimes bleak and might I add to some people potentially triggering subject matter. She wrote and narrated the audio version in a way that truly gave the book its own flavor. Some of the craziest things that you never really would have expected like being jealous of Ariana Grande for her prowess in the music industry, maybe even more so the $300,000 she was offered by the Nickelodeon talent agency. These are also confronted head on with poise and yet plenty of bravado. You can't put all that together and not be blown away by it. Especially being someone's first book. Number one, the number one book of 22 that came out in 22 is Life Force by Tony Robbins, Peter Diamandis, and Rob. This book is a metrical odyssey of organized, phenomenally up-to-date, and incredibly well-researched info on the cutting-edge biotech longevity and vitality of today and tomorrow, wrapped in heartfelt stories and high-energy level accessibility. I enjoyed it so much that I made a video about things I didn't enjoy about it. What on earth does, why, what? Or at least things that I could imagine others not enjoying about it. This book is a whopping 720 pages. The audiobook is almost 23 hours long. The topic of longevity and vitality is, is near and dear to Tony Robbins. If you've seen any seminars of his, I've actually seen him live. And by the way, I'm not some crazy Tony Robbins nut hugger, all right? I've only reviewed two of his books and I think he has like, I don't even know how many books he has. I think he has like seven. But now he brings Peter Diamandis, a man known for his work in space travel and longevity, and Dr. Robert Hariri, a surgeon, biomedical scientist, and serial entrepreneur in biomedicine and aerospace. So as you could imagine, Life Force was a bit of an information explosion waiting to happen. Something I always loved about Tony Robbins is how he uses his network and connections to gather and report incredible insights, and how he credits them as well. And he leveraged this in Life Force in ways you never would have expected, let alone by having two of these connections as co-authors. You learn about the power of stem cells, preventative care, organ regeneration, incisionless brain surgery, and way, way, way Way, way more. Something else that's really cool about it is that plenty of these solutions are out there. They're FDA approved, they're regulated, they're available, and either affordable or mainly covered by insurance, aka decently affordable, I guess depending on the insurance. Um, I didn't intend for things to be this way in 2022. Uh, again, 27 books is really kind of nothing for this channel. The previous year wasn't that many and that was 52. That was almost twice as many. But you never know what kind of curveballs life is gonna throw at you. I didn't know I was gonna get engaged a couple months ago. I didn't know I was gonna take a four month straight break from the all of these videos for work purposes. And I didn't know I was gonna end up making 51 more insight videos throughout the year. So it's not like I wasn't busy, but let's get it in 2023. I got a special, special feeling about this next year. So what are some of your favorite books that you checked out in 2022 that you would really recommend for 2023? Let me know in the comments below. I drop affiliate links in the description. And again, if you guys buy anything through those links, like maybe any of these books, then I get commission, which helps me build this channel to keep making these videos. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to give it a big thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already, because I don't get why people watch this far into my videos and they don't subscribe. But if you have subscribed and you want to turn it up just a notch and turn on that notification bell to get a notification whenever I drop new videos, 
videos, that would mean the world to me. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. You can find me everywhere and I will see you then.